Hi everyone, I'm Kat Carter from Save the Children's Emergency Response Team and I'm going to be here tonight in conversation with this man, Gareth Owen, our Humanitarian Director at Save the Children. He has an OBE as well, but he doesn't really like us to mention it. Um, he's a personal hero to many humanitarians around the world and tonight we're going to be talking about Syria, which is a cause and a country very close to his heart. So Gareth, I thought, if it's okay with you, if we could start by thinking about Syria before the conflict, what was it like? Oh, Syria was an ancient civilization, a beautiful country. My father used to go to Aleppo in, in the north of Syria to teach agriculture in the 70s. Many people think it's a desert, but much of it is, is very fertile agricultural land. It reminds me a lot of Tuscany. Um, really? It's a very, very educated society. There's, there was not political democracy there, of course, mm -hmm. but Almost everybody was very educated, good standards of health care. It was, to all, to all intents and purposes, a, a middle-class, middle-income country. Mm. And, of course, you have personal experience of Syria more recently. We all know about the brutal, brutal civil war that's been going on for nearly four years now. Just bring us back to the present. What's the situation in Syria at the moment, and what did you see when you were there? Well, I've been following the war since it started. Um, and, in fact, we used to say, uh, as we watched the Arab Spring sweep across what will happen if, if this comes to Syria. Um, and go, going back into Syria, it was, it, was, it, was, it was horrifying. I mean, what happens in, in a civil war like this is, is a slow motion descent into darkness. There's no other way to describe it. The civil war is being fought in the suburbs of the big cities. It's a medieval tactic of, of siege, starvation and surrender. Electricity is cut off, food supplies are blocked, commercial and aid is blocked, so that people are starved until they surrender. It's the most brutal form of conflict. All sides are using illegal weapons, um, and this is undoubtedly a, a war crime. There are no, there, there, there are no good guys in, in a conflict like this. All we can do is be there for the people caught up in the middle of this. Mm. And the numbers are, are terrifying, frankly. Um, the Syrian population was about 20 million. Um, now three quarters of that population live in poverty. Uh, the latest UN estimate suggests the country has been put back 40 years by this. And the statistics, frankly, uh, they're almost too horrifying to, to, to reveal. 160,000 people have been killed in the violence. Another 200,000 people have died from chronic illnesses, diabetes, cancers, things that were treated in Syria before, but now, of course, the healthcare is not there. 4,000 schools are closed. It's a terrifying existence for anybody. Mm -hmm. 11 million people in desperate need of humanitarian assistance. 3 million people have fled into neighbouring countries. The list of numbers just go on and on. And it's almost too big to comprehend in some ways. I mean, what is it, 11 million people? You know, half of those are children. Yes, and if you're a child today in Syria, uh, you know, it is abject misery. Um, Prior to the conflict, you would have led a normal life. You would have slept in your own bed. You would have got up, had your breakfast. You would have gone to school. You would have played with your friends. You'd be on Facebook. You might be a on Facebook. The, it's, a lot of the Syrian children it's are a very Facebook. educated. Yes, yeah. it's a very connected society. Uh, you would have uh, done your homework and gone to bed for another day at school. And yeah. these days, there is no school. These days, you will wake up having wet the bed through sheer terror. There won't be any breakfast. There won't be any school to go to. You'll spend the day queuing with your parents for some meagre rations. Maybe, if you're lucky, you'll be able to play with your friends, but it's far too dangerous for many to do that. And then many children are too scared to go to bed. They fear the night. Yeah. Pretty bleak picture. In the face of that, in the face of a country that is essentially ripping itself apart, what is it that we as aid workers, as part of Save the Children, as the wider humanitarian community. What is it that we're doing no, on we the ground? We do what we always do. We stand there alongside the people caught up in the middle of, of this. We're not on anyone's side. We're on the side of the, the innocent folk in the middle of all this, the, the children. Um, and we're doing everything we can. We, we've worked in the region for many, many years. Um, we work throughout Syria. We're able to work directly ourselves, and we have a range of partner organisations who we work with. And it's fantastically dangerous. Um, we were recently on the phone to our field manager uh, in a location inside Syria. Um, and as we were on the telephone, the siren went off. There was an enormous boom. 
uh, and he, he, he had to cut the call. A barrel bomb had landed near the, near the location. So it's extremely dangerous for aid workers. 59 aid workers have been killed inside Syria since the conflict began. 500 medical staff have been killed. There have been 150 attacks on medical facilities. And they are targeted, of course, because they're militarised. So schools and government buildings are, are used by armed factions uh, as, as bases. There are a 1,000 armed militia gangs inside Syria. Mm. To, to travel 100 kilometres from our, one of our rear bases to where we work inside, you go through 70 checkpoints, all manned by different 70. militias. 70. Wow. So it's a very, very volatile situation. It's a very complex operation. And yes, you could be forgiven for thinking it's an impossible task. But it's not. We've reached a million people with aid over the last three years in and around Syria. Hundreds of thousands inside Syria. Our programme is, is designed to provide people with the very basic things. There is no thriving at this point inside Syria. There is surviving. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing is keeping people alive in, in many different ways. We are feeding people. We are providing medical assistance. We are providing latrines and trucking water as people move from camp to camp. We follow them around. And yes, we are able to still provide some education for children. Uh, it's not huge numbers. It's only in the thousands. We would want that to be in the tens of thousands. But the issue is that a generation is being lost here. And I suppose the thing that terrified me, and I mean terrified me, when I was inside Syria recently, was to see young teenage boys emulating the ultra-extremists. The organised opposition in, in Syria the moderate opposition, has been co-opted by extreme terrorist gangs, really. Um, and here we are in the middle of the World Cup, and before, before all this, maybe the, uh, the heroes of the young Syrian boys would have been the footballers we see on our televisions. But yeah. when you go inside now, you see them wearing bandanas, the, the same bandanas of the ultra-extremists, you know, the black bandana with the white Arabic writing. And that's who they are emulating now. What does that say for the future? It's, it's, it's really stark. And yet, at the same time, you can... You can break through it. Um, randomly, one of the people with me when we went was a trained clown. He's also <laughs> one of our staff, but he's a very good clown. And he took with him um, whatever... Clowns, clowns, when they're travelling light, mm. always carry red sponge balls, the little sponge balls. About. <laughs> and he brought okay. these out from his pocket. And he just started to do tricks with them and produce these from behind the, uh, you know, the ears of these young boys. And he was really good at it. So they were like, wow, how's he done that? And before you knew it, they dropped the guard. They, weren't, they, they were a child again. Mm -hmm. And he was so good that some of the people carrying guns put their guns down, took their leather jackets. Mm -hmm. and they came and watched as well. And for a few minutes in the middle of this maelstrom, yeah. we had a, a circus show from a clown. And it just shows you what, can, what you can do. I mean, people want normality. That's what they mm -hmm. want this war over. It's simple. Yeah, absolutely. And thinking about that um, and people wanting the war over... When you spoke to people inside, when you've spoken to people since, what kind of things are you hearing about the individual experience? What I'm, what I'm getting at really is I think it's very hard for the general public and for me sometimes to understand the impact on one person, let alone you know, 11 million people. Well, each of those 11 million people has their own story. Yeah. And it's often a story of tragedy, even if you talk to our own staff. I mean, we have one staff member who's lost both their brothers. Everybody knows somebody who's, who's been caught up in this. So... So, you know, the stories are of incredible heroism as well. Um, my translator, to give you an idea of what Syria used to be like, was a pharmacist. He owned a chain of pharmacies. And he was trained by Boots in London. So he spoke perfect English. So all he really was trying to do was, was find a way to, to, to become an aid worker, if you like. He was a pharmacist. He had to become an aid worker. And that's what a lot of our partner organisations are doing. Many of them are middle-class people who have been forced to turn their hand to helping each other and their neighbours. And over the years, they've become very good at it. And they're taking extraordinary risks, extraordinary risks. One of our partners, uh, I can't mention the location for, because of security, but when you have this kind of brutal siege, what you have to do is, is make a, a dash for it when there's a lull in the fighting to bring assistance to people. So they literally buy bread and apples and other basic things in the market. And when the fighting lulls, they run into these enclaves, into these besieged suburbs, and they hand out stuff. And they're risking their lives to do that. So, so and you, I mean, you know yourself, Kat, you've met many of the refugees um, in the neighbouring countries, and the stories they tell you are heartbreaking. I was talking to one of my guys recently who said he met a family um, in Tatari camp uh, in Jordan, a place that you visited frequently. Mm -hmm. 
And he, he, he's just got back and he was saying, there's always, as we always know, there's always one family, that get, there's always one person that, that gets through to you. And it, it was a woman and she'd been telling him her story and she had walked, I don't know how many days, <coughs> pushing her husband who's in a wheelchair. And she'd got two of her friends to help because she was also push, they were also pushing her son who's also disabled and in a wheelchair and a brother-in-law who's disabled. So these three women were pushing these three, these three wheelchairs for several days and nobody would give them a lift because they would, it was just too complicated with the wheelchairs. And they'd finally got out of, out of Syria. Um, and that's where they met us. You know? And so Mohammed was the, the, the boy's name and we put him into one of our um, child-friendly spaces, we call it, where we provide some therapeutic care for, to help people with the immediacy of, of what they've experienced. And pretty soon, as, as many children do, he was smiling again uh, and playing with, with other children. The mother, of course was not, and I don't know how long before she will smile again, frankly. But um, Kat, you, you've met these people, you know what it's like. Yeah, and I'm reminded actually when you say that of a lot of the families that I met, not only in Zatri but in Lebanon as well, and the journeys, you would think that once they've made the decision to leave, to leave Syria, that they would get out and they would be quite safe. But the families that I spoke to, you know, faced the most horrendous journey. You know, I spoke to mothers who saw their children being shot as they were fleeing away from Syria, as they were crossing the border into Lebanon. Now they're living in no man's land, which is between Lebanon and Syria, and they're still coming under fire. While I was there, we came under shelling, and I was in Lebanon. So these people, even when they've left Syria, they're still not entirely safe. And of course, their memories, what, what's, what they've experienced, what has actually been done to them. Lots of these children have been tortured, as we know. It lives on, you know, unless you have that kind of outlet, doesn't it? Well, okay, and, and, and it affects us, of course. Um, yeah. I mean, we have to, we have to wrap up. Uh, but what I, what I feel about this is, is simple, really. It's the same, I've, I feel the same about Syria as I, I, I feel about any, any conflict that I've been to. I mean, this is particularly brutal and nasty. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's astonishing that this is going on in, in, you know, in our times. I mean, history will judge us very, very harshly. We fail to find a political solution. Though the British government, I have to say, has been fantastic. I think the Foreign Secretary and the Prime Minister here in the UK, we can be proud of them. They've, they've, they've made huge efforts to find a political settlement. One has not been forthcoming. The best we can hope for now is a, another UN resolution, uh, which should make the aid operation easier from neighbouring countries. But you know what I say to everybody like yourself. Um, it's simple. You know, despair is not an option. Mm. We do this uh, because it's our task. We're very good at it. We've been doing this for a long time. This is what humanitarian ism is about. So it's an exercise in sheer bloody-minded optimism. The war will end. Our task is simple. We have to keep as much of Syria as was intact for Syria's future. And I think everybody who's here tonight should be proud of, of themselves, frankly, for caring, because that means an awful lot to the people on the ground in Syria. Those people caught up in it. They know that you care, and that gives them hope. Aid gives hope. Hope is an incredibly powerful weapon against all this. Hope lets in the light. I think we'll leave it there. Thanks, Gareth. Uh, and thank you all for listening to us chat. Um, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.